I'm going to try and beat a record here this morning. They say that one of Robin Hood's men, Little John, shot a bow and arrow from Church Street Bridge to Arbor Hill. Well, I'm going to try and beat that. Stony batter. <laughs> The Ford of Hurdles, Bolla Artlia, the place where Dublin gets one of its three Gaelic names, the gateway to the High Kings of Tara, one of the five great roads radiating from Tara, Slee Coolan, crossed the Liffey at Church Street Bridge on its way down to Wicklow. At one time, this was the only bridge that crossed the Liffey. It was put here thousands of years ago by the cattle raiders who came down to Leinster and came back up to the Lippy and couldn't cross, so they put down a hurdle ford, and it was around the hurdle ford that the city of Dublin grew. Aaron Key, the birthplace of the golden orator Edmund Burke. The Dominicans built a chapel on the bridge. It's say that it was commanded by King Edward III, who stated that the first mass every morning was to be offered up for him, the king, his wife, the queen, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, and the souls of the faithful departed. But should the poor clergy in St. Mickens must have been very disappointed to see a church go up on the bridge. Because after all, St. Mickens was the spot where anyone got their spiritual desires before setting out on the high road to Tara and further afield. The church is standing there for almost a thousand years. Aye, and for 600 years was the only parish church on the north side of Dublin. And then, of course, they divided the parish between St. Mary's, St. Mickens, and St. Paul's. Now, in the vaults, you have the Shears brothers lying side by side, who were hanged at Newgate in 1798. Out in the cemetery, you have the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, the Most Reverend Dr. Carpenter, buried over here. Above, you have Dr. Charles Lucas, the great patriot. You have above the grave of Oliver Bond and the Henry Jacksons. There's three pronunciations of the name. The people in Ratgar say St. Michael's, which is probably correct anyway. The people in County Dublin say St. Michan. And the people in the heart of Dublin say St. Michan's. Here in St. Michan's graveyard today, I'm thinking of a lady who lived in Clonsharve Castle. Her name was Mary Ann de Fippo. Now, the husband, Adam, owned the castle and all vast estates in Clontarf. But sure, when he died, didn't the Crown move in and seize all his property? But the bold Mary Ann was up and she said, I'm the widow, the land is mine. Now, she was 78 years of age. So the Crown decided, ah, let her have it. Sure, she'd be only there for a few years. A few years, she lived to be 118 years of age and saw them all down and is buried here in St. Mickens.
Hammond Lane is a corruption of the name Hangman's Lane, but this was the road to the gallows at Arbor Hill. Old Church Street, the home of the Capuchin Friary. The street echoes with memories of Father Albert and Dominic, Sebastian and Lavinus. They say when James Connolly was in Dublin Castle in 1916, he was asked, do you want a priest? Yes, says Connolly, send me a Capuchin. Today, the great tradition of the Capuchins is being followed by Father Philip O'Connor, Father Luke Brown, and Brother John Hickey. A few yards up the street here was the outpost of Ned Daly's garrison in 1916, Riley's Port. And it was opposite Riley's Port that Kevin Barry was arrested in 1920 and taken to Mountjoy Jail where he was hanged on the 1st of November. The woman was sitting on a bit of a butter box outside our house here and she saw Kevin Barry under the lorry and she, she, got, she saw the lorry about to move off and she got, she got frightened. She thought the lorry was going to kill her. Oh, 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 mister, look, look at the boy, mind the boy. Stop the lorry, the boy. And, of course, the British Army stopped the lorry and Kevin Barry was arrested under it. Now, that poor old lady uh, uh, had a very bad nervous breakdown after that. And the unfortunate ending of that story was that the old lady sitting in the same spot here on our butter box was actually killed against our own hall door by an articulated lorry that came down and the back portion came away and crashed her to death up against our own hall door here in Church Street. Isn't that an unusual seat? The seat has been here so long that the back of the tree has grown out over the seat. I suppose there's a bit of history in that. But sure, there's history all around this place. This is the King's Inn. The building was designed by James Gandon, and the foundation stone was laid in August 1800. The King's Inn was built on a site of ground that they got in 1794. But between one thing and another, it was six years before they started building. Now, we're coming up to what was known as Primate's Hill, where this was the residence of the Primate of all Ireland, the Archbishop of Armagh, lived down here on Primate's Hill. In fact, four Primates lived here, and one of them, by the name of Robinson, is said that he found it so hard to pay his bills and keep the house going that he came out one morning and he stopped the pauper. He said, excuse me, sir, would you like that house behind you? I would, says the pauper. Well, says he, there's the keys. And the bills is on me desk downstairs and went off and the say was never seen again. So the poor man must have been driven mad with bills. The first King's Inn, the say, was in around Exchequer Street. And then they moved up to where City Hall is today. And later, the work around Christ Church. And then, of course, when the Dominican Friary became vacant after the suppression of the monasteries, the King's Inn moved there. And that's how you have Inn's Key today. Well, that's really King's Inn's Key. They were there for quite a while, and then they moved up to this side of ground. The benchers, of course, opened up this park for the public, and it's a great place for the elderly people around the locality to come in here and sit on the park bench and read the paper and have a chat, and a place for the children to play and to be in off the dangers of the road. I'd like to introduce my two friends here in King's Inn. Uh, that's Ted, and this here is Arthur. You see their names on the doorway here. Ted and Arthur, the graduates. Come on, Christopher, come on, come on, Chris Brown, Christopher. Yeah. Just skip it again. Yeah. Hold on. Ring, 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 
the King's Inn leads out into Henrietta Street, named after the wife of the Duke of Grafton. They say it was here that Philpot Curran was stopped one day coming out of the King's Inn and asked, Philpot, would you have a shilling to bury a poor attorney? Here's a guinea, says Philpot, bury 21 of them. Of course, Henrietta Street was the home of the Earls, the Lord Norberties, the Lord Mount Giles, the home of the Earl of Thomond, who was supposed to be a direct descendant of Brian Baru, and the home of the Earl of Kingston, whose son, Edward Kingston, published and printed at his own expense the Antiquities of Mexico. The seven volumes cost him £32,000. He later went into debt, was taken to the debtor's prison because he couldn't pay his bills, and there he contacted fever, and on the 27th of February, 1837, Edward died. Just imagine the antiquities of Mexico from the streets of Dublin. This was the original entrance to the House of Industry in Dublin. I wonder how many Dubliners realise what the foundation here meant to them and their city. In August 1773, Dublin Corporation decided to set up a House of Industry. And from this House of Industry grew, in many ways, the social and medical development of the city of Dublin as we know it today. The idea of the House of Industry was to keep the beggars off the streets of Dublin. And in they came in our thousands, many of them sick and ill with fever. And a few doctors got together one night and were talking about the plight of the inmates of the House of Industry. And they decided to go up and give their medical assistance. And from this kind act grew the idea that what was needed were several hospitals. The Richmond Hospital for surgical matters, the Whitworth for medical matters, the Hardwick for fever matters, the Auxiliary for nose, throat and ear, a school of medicine, the Bedford Block for children, and for the mental ill, the Richmond Lunatic Asylum. The Morning Star Hostel was founded by the Legion of Mary for the poor of Dublin and welcomes with open arms the poor people who come to its doors today. This is the spot of the Channel Row Nunnery. The first nuns were the Benedictines who came in 1689 but after the Battle of the Bayern, they packed up and went back to Belgium. And it was vacant for a while, and then in 1712 came the Poor Clares, which they were harassed and arrested, and in 1715 they pulled out. And in 1717, the Dominican sisters came in and stayed here for nearly a 100 years before moving to Clontarf and out to St Mary's in Cabra. This was the only spot that survived the plague of 1575. And that's why the House of Industry was founded here. Well, as well as being the healthiest spot, it surely must be the brainiest spot. Well, look at all the wonderful schools and hospitals that have come out of Channel Row and North Brunswick Street, the area of the House of Industry, and all the brains that's across the road in good old Brunner. Cheer up, Brunner, they're known everywhere. The bit down singer and left them lying there. Singer called for mercy, but mercy wasn't there. So cheer up, Brunner, they're known everywhere. Paddy Crosby is no stranger to Dubliners. He went to school in Brunner and spent all his life teaching in Brunner and now he's gone into retirement. 
and I know the people of Dublin will wish Paddy many happy days in retirement because he put the school around the corner on the map, not only in Dublin, but all over Ireland. Beyond Brunner School is Red Cow Lane, leading into Smithfield, the one-time home of the Earl of Bechtov. But I think Smithfield is best known for the Maybush. The almond butcher buyers, they used to grow their Maybush in Smithfield. And of course, the Liberty buyers had come over to try and cut down the Maybush and bring it back to the Coombe. And of course, the buyers from Smithfield would go over to the Coombe and bring back the Maybush. Now, there was a little ballast made up about Bill Durham, who was the head of the men of Smithfield, and about the night that he went over to the Liberties and brought back the Maybush. But sure, later on, didn't the Liberty boys sneak back when Bill was asleep? And as the verse went, Bill Durham being up the night before was now in his flea park taking a snore when he heard the mob passing his door, re ruthery dundee and then Bill went out and found a no bush in Smithfield. He said, Your soul says Bill Durham, I'm left all alone. Be the hokey that Lordy of Smithfield is gone. The hospital and free school of King Charles II at Oxmanstown was found by Royal Charter on the 5th of December, 1670. The first foundation was in Queen Street, but this building was designed by Thomas Ivory, a Corkman, and was started on the 16th of June, 1773. And for generations, it was known to Dubliners as the Blue Coat School. Now, how it got its name, Blue Coat, was from the blue uniform worn by the boys. And at one time, the boys used to wear a black leather belt around the uniform. And if they missed their lessons or were bold in class, the belts were taken from their waist and they received their slaps from their own belts. The Blue Coat School was taken over by the Duke of Tyrconnell and the poor little blue boys were thrown out in the street. They needed the grounds and the building for James's army. Now, it was here that King James reviewed the troops before riding off to the Battle of the Boyne. But of course, when he rode back from the Battle of the Boyne, he came flying down Constitution Hill and up into Dublin Castle, jumped down off his horse and said, the cowardly Irish, the raced away and left me. And fair Fanny Jennings came out of the castle gate and she says, well, it seems as if your majesty has won the race. King James was back first from the Boyne. But a few days later, King Billy was back up here in Dublin. And he put the blue boys back in the blue coat school where they belonged. I usually walk up here. It's not every day I drive to Arbor Hill. The first time that I came through this gateway, my mother said I was pushed in a goat car. She was bringing me up to see Pierce and Connolly's grave in Arbor Hill. All the men who fought in Easter week 1916. There was no memorial till them in those years. A shopkeeper, a poet, 
a school teacher, a shop assistant, a clerk in the volunteer's office, a sculptor. You can see some of his work on Western Road Church. A poet and a dramatist, a water bailiff of the Dublin Corporation, a clerk in Kennedy's Bakery, worked in the Treasury Department of Dublin Corporation, a railway clerk, a silk weaver from the Liberties, a trade union and socialist organiser, a newspaper manager, editor, writer. 16 dead men, 14 lying here in a quicklime grave, Roger Casement in Glasnevin and Thomas Kent in Cork. Among all the tragedy and stories of Easter week 1916, outstanding in my mind at the moment is the romance of Joseph Mary Plunker and Grace Gifford, who are married in Kilmainham Jail a few hours before his execution. Whenever I think of Plunkett, I always think of his beautiful poem, The Presence of God. I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows, his tears fall from the sky. I see his face in every flower, the thunder and the singing of the birds are but his voice, and carven by his power. Rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn. His strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn. His cross is every tree. There used to be an old saying in Dublin, hi for Bob and hi for Joan and hi for Stony Batter. And why wouldn't the hive for Stony Batter? For it's the oldest place name in Dublin, dating back thousands of years. Bohernet Luck, the road of stones on its way to Tara. This was so far out of Dublin city that the people of Stony Batter used to say, uh, excuse me, are you going into Dublin tomorrow? Well, if you're going into Dublin tomorrow, I want you to get a message for me. Of course, that was when the walls were around Dublin and they had to cross over to Parliament Street to go in through the gates into the city of Dublin. And are you living in Stony Batter? I'm living here, yes, just well, off, uh, off here in Stony Batter. Very good. For 27 years. Do you like it around here? Oh, yes, that's quite nice here. Yeah, it is a good quite spot. Quite nice, all yeah. right. Are you out doing your shopping or your... No, just out there. Uh, I wasn't too well. I had a bit of sore throat. I was up at the oh, camera there yeah. getting a few tablets oh, just. Back didn't in... shave or not on this morning. Ah, you're all right. I laid too long road, in my bed, What about you know? me? <laughs> <laughs> Stony Batter looks up to Manor Street, the birthplace of Austin Clark, the poet, and it looks down to Blackhall Place, called after Thomas Blackwall, the Lord Mayor of Dublin. <laughs> you have all heard of Biddy Mulligan, the pride of the comb. Well, this is Larry Mulligan, the pride of Stony Banner. I've wandered north and how I loved it by Stony Batter and Arbor Hill and all around the morning star where Dublin's poor are welcome still. <laughs> 